What's cracking, Big Dogs? Welcome back to the dungeon. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE Fantasy Football. I am Nicholas, that is Noah, at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you are following us on the Twitter to get all the nuggets that we have throughout the week, all the research that we do. This particular video is our top trade targets for fantasy football. Week seven, we're talking buy low, we're talking sell high guys coming off of big weeks, coming off of disappointing performances that we want to buy low on, all those types of guys, because obviously uh, trades are starting to manifest a little bit more as we you know, get towards the playoffs. Managers are starting to panic a little bit. I, I forgot that uh, trade deadlines are actually a thing in fantasy football, so these videos are going to end up stopping around, what, like week nine or yeah, 10? Yeah, I think it's around Thanksgiving. I think it's week 12, but I think it's a week before then, typically. Right, okay, we'll have, to, we'll have to pivot and uh, figure some other – types of content out so let us know down below in the comment section when the trade deadlines end up evaporating in your league what kind of content do you want to see out of us every Wednesday maybe we'll just go on vacation and not put out any more content I was thinking about that just like cutting out like week 10 just completely stop putting out anything on my YouTube channel but until then until then we're going to provide you with that juicy 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 content that we've been doing all summer all season long Noah are we ready yes I'm going to keep it short because I know what you're going to do you, I know you like you were <laughs> you were thinking that there was going to be a trick question there. I was like, "Are you ready?" And you were just like, uh, "Yeah." I, uh, I was like on the edge of my get seat. The fucking intro. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> After that beautifully, beautifully segmented intro, I'm going to start us off with a position that we haven't really talked too much about on our trade targets show, and that is the tight end position. Now, if there was one tight end that we went into the year really, 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 really excited about, it was Travis Kelsey, tight end of the Kansas City Chiefs. He's been a little bit disappointing, but he's still been fine. I think it's a lot to do with the fact that some other guys have really emerged, right? We came into the year thinking it's Kelsey, it's Kittle, it's Ertz, and there's nobody else in that class. But we've seen Austin Hooper, Mark Andrews, Darren Waller uh, really, really explode onto the scene, giving, you know, Travis Kelsey and those guys a little less value than we would have liked for the, you know, draft equity that we had to invest into them. But if you look at Travis Kelsey, he's still third in fantasy points for tight ends. He leads all tight ends in receiving yards, 497. Uh, if you were to put that 497 yards among wide receivers, he would have the seventh highest total in the entire NFL. He is on pace for 1,325 receiving yards this year. That is 11 yards fewer than he had last year when he broke the single season record for receiving yards in a season for tight ends. Obviously, George Kittle ended up breaking it like eight minutes later, but Kelsey set the record last year and he's on pace for 11 yards fewer this year. Uh, so the yardage is there. The receptions are there. The, the touchdowns are obviously what is holding him back a little bit. But when they do come, and they will for Kelsey and this passing offense, Kelsey's going to pull away from the rest of the pack at this position. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Mahomes has thrown for 14 touchdowns this year. Only one of them has gone to Kelsey, one out of 14. That's 7.1% of Mahomes' touchdowns. Last year, Kelsey caught 10 of Mahomes' 50 touchdowns which is 20%. Eventually, those are going to start meeting in the middle, the percentages, right, just coming back to the norm. And Kelsey's going to see another five, six, seven touchdowns probably over the remaining whatever 10 games that they have left. If you look at, like, his consistency as well, um, this game against Houston a couple weeks ago was his worst game, four for 58, which means it's probably your best – or this past weekend was probably your best chance to buy low on a guy like Kelsey because maybe he's been a little bit disappointing for the owners that, you know, used a first-round pick on him or used an early second-round pick on him, and they're kind of getting frustrated. And they're like, oh, it wasn't worth using a pick on a tight end, and they'll swap him for a low-end wide receiver one or, a, you know, a high-end wide receiver two or something like that. But other than that, he's had 70-plus receiving yards in all five games beside this previous one. Uh, it's extremely difficult to find that type of consistency at tight end. And he's caught seven passes in three of those five games. So what we're looking at is his touchdown regression. Yeah, Mahomes had 50 last year. He's on pace for like 37 this year. But he's also on pace for 5,600 passing yards this year. So while last year's numbers were crazy, they're still just as crazy this year, just in a different category. So I'm still all in on Kelsey because I think the touchdowns are going to bounce back. This offense is going to figure it out. They're going to be a lot more opened up now that Tyree Kill is back. I mean, he only played on – 
He was the lowest snap percentage of all the wide receivers for the Chiefs last week. And we saw how much of a difference he made in that wide receiver group. He was the only one that was making big plays. That's going to open up the entire offense for Hill, for Kelsey, by Kelsey right now. Yeah, the offense has been struggling a little bit over these past couple of weeks. But as you said, with Tyreek Hill back and, you know, Sammy Watkins is out this past week and he was out for most of the week before. Maybe that kind of worked into that because they didn't have any receivers that they could really trust. With Tyreek Hill just running down the field and getting wide open, um, getting them into the red zone a little bit more, Kelsey's going to be bound to see uh, to be on the end of some touchdown passes from Mahomes. And this running game, as much as we love Damian Williams and want him to be a buy-low candidate, the running game isn't very good right now, which just means they're going to still continue to throw, and Travis Kelsey's be a huge benefactor of that. Yeah, that was a uh, – I'd like to apologize to the audience. I don't, I don't usually apologize for my trade target um, picks, but the, the Damian Williams was uh, a little malnourished looking back at it because he took all the snaps the week before, and then all of a sudden he got put in the Andy Reid doghouse, and I don't, we don't know the reasons behind it. They didn't really say anything, but it's, it's, it's looking like it's going to be a running back by committee. So, obviously hold off on the, uh, on the Dame Williams stuff, but Kelsey's an absolute buy low in this offense. Yeah, and a running back by committee that I do want to be a part of is in the San Francisco 49ers backfield, and it's Tevin Coleman as a buy low candidate. And the reason for this is I know he's put up two pretty good games in a row, and coming back from injury against Cleveland, we weren't exactly sure if that usage was either him being eased in or if it was because Matt Breida broke off that huge run in the beginning and maybe, hey, the San Francisco 49ers do want Breida to be their starting back. Um, they just limited him because it was a blowout against Cleveland, and um, they ended up giving Coleman the line share of the touches. But we saw this past week that Tevin Coleman is the clear-cut number one in this offense, in a very good offense, I may add. And, you know, he played 55% of the snaps. He saw 18 carries. He saw three targets. So he had 21 opportunities. And this is huge. I know we don't usually, like, advocate for buying guys who are in committees, especially if they're not somebody who can, like, catch passes, like a James White, like a Tariq Cohen, who isn't doing well this year. But um, you get the gist, like, He's getting so many looks and so many touches on an offense that's very good, on a defense that allows them to hold on to the ball. They're number two in time possession this year at like 35 minutes and three seconds or something. But over the past three weeks when like everything started to gel um, or, or over the last three games because they had a bye uh, in that span, um, they're actually number one at like 37 minutes and 37 seconds. So they're holding the ball for like nearly 60% of the game. Um, and they're running the ball 39 times a game, which is number one. So if there's ever going to be like a committee that you want to buy in on, it's San Francisco because he's still the number one guy getting like 50% of 39 carries is what, 19 and a half. Like if he's getting 50% of the touches out of that backfield, that's still a huge total. And we see that he's not only getting like touches in between the twenties, this past game, he had four carries inside the five, five carries inside the 10. And he seems to just have taken over that red zone role. And we saw Jeff Wilson when Tevin Coleman was out, score I think three or four touchdowns just off goal line opportunities alone so if Tevin Coleman's going to give you those yards between the 20s a few targets and catches here and there along with goal line work for a team that's number one in red zone trips a game at 4.4 per game that's absolutely huge and not to mention their offensive line is like the best in the league run blocking wise and that's without them having their left tackle for basically the entire year they did just lose Kyle Juszczyk uh, like their star fullback and their right tackle Mike McGlinchey but even last game, Coleman put up some pretty good numbers against what is seen as like a decent uh, Los Angeles Rams front. So I wouldn't hold too much stock into their offensive line uh, losing its tackles, especially when you have a guy like Kyle Shanahan who just seems to like scheme up any running back in that backfield to do well. I know Coleman hasn't been quite like as efficient as Matt Breida, but that doesn't matter because he's still got the lead job. And I would also put Breida in here as like a buy low because he didn't have a huge game, but he's still got a lot of touches. I think he had like 13 carries and four receptions. So this whole backfield is something I'm buying in on. And if you look at their schedule upcoming, they don't face a defense that I'm necessarily afraid of starting either one of these guys against outside of week 14 against New Orleans. Like they play Washington, whose run defensive grade is high, but their points allowed to running backs is like high in the sense that they give up a lot. Uh, Carolina, Arizona, I know has uh, low points allowed, but with Pat Pete coming back, I'm sure offenses will start to skew a little bit more towards the run because they actually have a starter in their secondary and somebody who's competent, um, Seattle, whatever, Green Bay. New Orleans in week 14 is a very strong defense, but by that point, Mike McGlinchey, Joe Staley, and Kyle Juszczyk are expected to be back from injury, and I'll take their offensive line over the Saints' defensive line any day of the week. They're extremely talented. They have uh, 5.4 adjusted line yards, so they're number one run blocking as is, and with all their pieces back and healthy, there isn't a defensive line I'd be afraid to start either one of these guys against, and Tevin Coleman getting those goal line touches 
on an offense like this, I don't see any way he isn't like a high-end RB2 from here on out. Yeah, the Niners are basically doing what every NFL team like thinks they want to do in the fact that they play really good defense and control the clock with the ground game. I'm just looking at the last three box scores of the 49ers games. 41. This is just running back totals. 41 carries, 40 carries, 40 carries. It's like every single game they're giving their running backs 40 carries. And that, that's just on the ground. That's not even talking about receptions or targets or anything like that. Tevin Coleman is getting like you said, the Jeff Wilson role, basically, which was Coleman's to begin with, because his size is obviously a lot bigger than Matt Breda. So him and Breda are both going to eat. They're both going to get plenty of touches, you know, throughout any of these games, as long as the game script allows it. And, you know, we look at the matchups with Washington, it's Arizona, two of the next four games, like they should really, really benefit from the game script that they're going to have. And even if, you know, he's a little bit less efficient against these front sevens that are a little bit more intimidating, like the Saints or whatever, it, it just, it, that's their game plan. Like that's what Kyle Shannon does. He runs the ball and he runs it effectively and he runs it a lot. So um, Coleman, just in terms of being on a team that's five and zero, getting the majority of the, of the snaps, getting a majority of the carries, and especially down inside that five yard line is just super, 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 super important. Important. So I'm on, uh, I'm on board with, with uh, Tevin Coleman there as a buy low for sure. Here's a question for you. Who would you rather have rest of season? And would you make this trade Derek Henry for Tevin Coleman? Uh, that's a good one. I, I would probably side with Derrick Henry only because he's seeing like a hundred percent of the carries in that Tennessee backfield. I wouldn't feel good about it, but I think there's like, there are going to be days where Matt Breda breaks off for a 70 yard touchdown run. You know what I mean? And that eats up a sizable portion of the entire running back production for that day, which obviously takes away a, a possession, a drive and all that kind of stuff for, um, the 49ers. So I'm a, I'm a little bit more concerned just the fact that they have a little bit of a running back by committee there in uh, San Fran. But like, I don't think it's that far apart for what people probably assume um, in their minds with the question like that. Now, I was just gonna say, I brought that up as a buy low, or I brought that up because he may not seem like a buy low. But when you put it in like the context of who would you rather have, and it's actually a question between him and Derrick Henry, it kind of shows that people aren't valuing Tevin Coleman as highly as Derrick Henry. Like, I agree. I would rather have Derrick Henry because he's dominating that team um, yeah. as a whole. But you got to realize that Tevin Coleman has the opportunity to be a running back too from here on out. And I think people are viewing him as more of a low-end option than what he really is. Yeah, I think if he could start putting together a few, like, big plays throughout the game, you know, like a 30-yarder here, a 45-yard reception here or something, he's going to have some monster days because the touchdowns are going to come just just by, you know, what their offense does, the amount of possessions that they have inside the red zone and stuff and Jimmy G's not a, a drive finisher they want to they want to hand the ball to the running backs and that's how they get in the end zone do you know who the number one wide receiver was in week six no it wasn't Will Fuller <laughs> <laughs> um no it was uh it was Stefan Diggs seven for 167 and three touchdowns versus the Philadelphia Eagles he is a sell high candidate absolutely in my mind Philadelphia is 100%. They are a funnel defense this year, right? And by that, I mean their run defense is absolutely elite. Their pass defense, I would say, I mean, their pass defense is elite as well, but I, I would say it's anti-elite, right? It's in, the, it's in the other category of elite in that it's so bad that there's almost no teams that are as bad as them on the passing side of things. You know, I actually have a tryout with them next week to play corner, so I might not be in next week's video. I'm sure I will see you like on television then in one week's time because <laughs> at their current depth right now, whether it's just talent or whether it's health or whatever the fucking case may be, they are awful. So these teams are having to pivot away from the run, right? Even if it is the Minnesota Vikings and they want to run with Dalvin Cook, it is very, 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 very hard to beat a very tough front seven, especially when you have the option of fading that uh, offensive scheme and just going towards the pass when you have guys as talented as Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen on the outside to take advantage of the horrible cornerback play that we've seen in Philadelphia so far, right? We're all enamored by Stefan Diggs' talent. There's no question about it. He is still someone that I absolutely want shares of in, uh, in dynasty leagues. He was something that I was actually forced to play this week in uh, one of my dynasty leagues because I had like three guys on a bye. Worked out very, 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 very well. So Diggs is a guy I want in dynasty. Redraft though, when you look at his game logs, like more often than not, he's finishing outside of like the top 45 wide receivers in fantasy. Week one, two for 37, one for 49, three for 15, three for 44, right? He, he's more often than not, he's putting you up very, very, very dud-like games. And this was a problem for him even going back to last year, right? When the team was much more pass heavy. 
he finished with fewer than 50 receiving yards in eight of 15 games last year. So 53% of the time he was giving you 50 receiving yards or fewer. You were just hoping that he got into the end zone. And what we're just sitting here and we're really thinking that because he did this against the Philadelphia Eagles, that he's fixed and this Vikings offense, his passing offense is now going to be an explosion. Like, no, they want to run the ball still. The Eagles have allowed the single most fantasy points to wide receivers in 2019. And I have a chart here of just the points that they've allowed to wide receivers throughout the year. Five for 125 and a touchdown to Terry McLaurin week one. Then Julio and Calvin Ridley both go nuts against them. The very next week, Marvin Jones, six for 101 and a touchdown. Devonta Adams, 10 for 180. It's like the list goes on and on and on. Of course, nothing happens against the New York Jets because they play against Luke Falk. But then Stephon Diggs, right back at it, seven for 167 and three. Like if you have a problem completing passes, you play against the Eagles, it's no longer a problem. But I'm telling you, this will be a problem for Diggs going forward. And even looking towards the future more so, his playoff schedule, right? We're, we're almost halfway through the year. So you kind of have to start thinking about playoffs and whether or not you want certain guys in your lineup because if they're not going to be in your lineups for weeks 14, 15, and 16, there's almost no point of having them on your roster, right? Week 14, they play against Detroit. He'll be shadowed by Slay. Week 15, the Chargers. He'll be shadowed by Casey Hayward. Week 16, Green Bay, probably Jair Alexander. So all guys that he's going to be getting the top games from because Thielen, again, works in the slot. We know that. They, Diggs always takes the top cornerback. So unless he's going against Philadelphia, it's very hard to get really excited about a guy like Diggs. I guess he'll have his blow-up game just because he's so talented and he'll beat the defense every once in a while. Kirk Cousins overthrows him sometimes. Like, he had the big game against Chicago, but that's after three weeks of not getting it done. So, like, are you really going to throw him in your lineup against Chicago? So, with me, it's just like it, – it's just always been a consistency thing, not a talent thing. So, as soon as he needs to be in a lineup where, one, he's either the clear wide receiver one or – a very pass-heavy offense. One of those two things needs to happen in order for Stefan Diggs to hit the ceiling or the potential that we all as fantasy owners want him to hit. Yeah, and if you look at those defenses that you brought up in the fantasy playoffs, like even if they decide to put Thielen outside and they move Diggs into the slot, two of those teams, the Lions and the Chargers, I don't know as much about the Packers who they have behind Jair Alexander, but the Lions have Justin Coleman who's playing out of his mind along with Darius Slay. Yeah. And if the Chargers have anything on defense, I mean, Derwin James will be back by then. They have Casey Hayward, but they also have Desmond King out of the slot. So that he's going to face, like, a couple, like, meaning two, like, two, at least two good cornerbacks in most of those games. And down the stretch, you need those points. And from a guy who, when he's injured, we all know those splits. Like, when he goes into the week on the injury report, he's not going to produce. When he's facing defenses that give up a lot of, like, ground game on the, like, a lot of rushing yards like the Chargers – that offense probably isn't going to throw too much. Like, <laughs> that was terrible. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That just made me laugh. I was, like, plugging my charger in, and I just heard you struggling so bad. Yeah. I would like, have to say, like, ground game or run game. <laughs> but, yeah, he's going to be facing a lot of defenses that are going to probably funnel more towards the run than the pass down the stretch, and that's not what you want out of, like, your wide receiver two or a flex option um, in your fantasy playoffs. Yep. So, Stefan Diggs. Get him out of here. Another sell high. Devonta Freeman of the Atlanta Falcons. And a lot of the concerns we had for him going into the season had more to do with injury than it did with usage concerns. Because heading into the year, they had really no competition behind him. They had like Ito Smith and Quadri Allison they drafted. But like you expected him to run away with the job, get 70, 80% of the snaps. That isn't the case. In four out of his six games, he's played less than 65% of the snaps. And I know that's like a pretty high number. But when you have no competition behind you on a team that doesn't like necessarily run a lot, you want to be up in like that 70 to 75 percent snap share. And that's just not in the cards for Devonta Freeman. And the only games where he did have higher than those percentages was last game where Ito Smith, was he coming back from an injury or was that a couple weeks back? Uh, that was a couple weeks back. A couple weeks back. All right. So that was fake news. But the other one that he played like 90 percent of the snaps, uh, Ito Smith got hurt like three plays in with a concussion. So the only games he's really had um, a big snap share was one out of necessity and number two this past week when they were throwing a ton and he was getting involved in the passing game. And that's really been the only thing that's salvaging his value at this point. Like his rushing pace is like 600 or 700 yards just because he's been like extremely inefficient on the ground. He's only had two games with over three yards of carry. And I know yards of carry isn't like a great metric to look at efficiency, but I mean, he only had two games over 30 rushing yards overall. Yeah, it's, um, he hasn't got in the end zone via rushing either. Yeah, it's been awful for him. And when you have a guy in a timeshare who's not really doing anything on the ground and he's more relying on passing game work, when you're probably the fourth or fifth option 
behind Hooper, behind Sanu, Ridley, Julio Jones. Like, I get this is a team that this one that wants to pass a ton, but when you're fourth or fifth in line to get targets from like an offense that doesn't have the time possession to really score all that much because their defense is awful. Like, what can you really expect out of him? I think like after these past two like big games um, against Houston and against Arizona, um, people are expecting him to be a high end RB two because he did get pretty good usage in those games and a lot through the air. Um, and he has three receiving touchdowns over that span, but I just don't see him being much more than like a back end RB two and like on that running back two or three borderline and his second touchdown. I know you like don't want to throw away stats and throw away numbers, but I'll put a picture on the screen of the play that was called and how he scored. There was like nobody within 10 yards of him. It was like a completely broken play. And I get that these numbers do count and he did have a good week last week, but how often are you going to bank on like a broken play against a team like Arizona week after week? I mean, you, you can't rely on him to be like a James White, like heavily involved in the passing game um, because of the options ahead of him. And just because that really has never been like a major part of his game. And especially if you look at like the schedule upcoming, I don't like know the rankings of strength of schedule, but Devonta Freeman has to be up there for one of the toughest. Um, the Rams, they're, uh, they're the only good defense up until week uh, 16 where he faces like a favorable matchup. After that, Seattle, at New Orleans, Carolina, Tampa, New Orleans, Carolina, San Francisco. All these are defenses that stymie the run, and they're going to probably have to throw a bit more. And if Devonta Freeman gets his work in the passing game, cool. He'll be like a back-end RB2. But relying on him getting seven or eight targets – I just don't want to trust that as a running back too at this point. And I would rather flip him for a guy like Tevin Coleman or I don't even know, like a Marlon Mack coming off his buy. Maybe you can buy low on him. Yeah. I think like a good gauge of, of whether or not you think you should sell somebody or like what your feelings are about somebody is ask somebody who owns that player. Ask somebody who owns Devonta Freeman, how they feel about drafting Devonta Freeman this year. I bet He'll you tell us in the him. comments that he's turning it around and he's the guy now. <laughs> That's probably true to be honest with you, but <laughs> he's if he fell down right for this, now. Yeah, I mean, if you've held on for this long, five or six weeks, then you're, I mean, you're probably excited for the last performance. But, like, this was the first time that you felt good about it. And, I mean, you're looking at the last two games, Arizona and Houston, which were the two games that he played well in and that you could theoretically sell high on, right? And it's, those are, like, two of the fastest-paced teams in the NFL. And those are games that ended up being 32-53 to 53 and 33-34, to 34, two of the highest-scoring games that we're probably going to see in the NFL all of this year. And you look – you know, you, you brought up the schedule – the Rams, Seattle, New Orleans, Carolina, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, like a few of these teams are high paced in terms of like, you know, snaps and a lot of the plays being run in a game. But it's like Tampa Bay, whose rush defense is very, very, very good. Um, the Rams, whose rush defense is also very, very, very good. And then Seattle, New Orleans, they play a very, very slow paced game. So I don't see this turning into a game where Devonta Freeman can see the type of targets and the type of volume that he's seen over the last a uh, couple weeks and he's not going to be efficient with the carries like we already know that right he's had a couple of good games with him like you said under 3.0 yards per carry in four out of six games under 30 rushing yards in four out of the six games so he's just not a guy I was ever high on um, if I mean if you watch him play like sure he shows a little bit of burst every once in a while but he just looks like you know whatever like he's there grinding getting the yards and stuff and when they open up holes or when there's a lot of yardage in front of him available he'll get those yards but he's not someone that you're like, oh, shit, Devonta Freeman looks like he's back to 2015 Devonta Freeman form. Not someone that I think is going to hold up um, over the entirety of the season. Now, yeah, especially with the offensive line, not really opening up holes for anybody. So I don't think he's going to have any breakaway yeah. runs that are going to change your opinion on him. That's the, yeah, that's the other problem, too, is like he's already not having success running the ball. And we just keep losing more linemen. Like every single week we get more guys banged up and on the practice injury report and just out for games and weeks and stuff. So they're going to have to keep relying on, on the passing game to um, score points because our defense is not stopping anybody. Because we're just going to keep letting up points and we're not going to ever be able to rely on that ground game. He's never going to be getting, you know, 20, 25 carries a game. It's, it's more more often than not, he's going to be in like the 11 to 13 range than the 18 to 20 range. and that's not someone I really want to rely on. And if you could sell him for, you know, a mid to high end RB2 price, that's exactly what I would do right now. Let me ask you, Devonta Freeman or Melvin Gordon rest of season? That offensive line is awful too. I would take Melvin Gordon though. Just the trend, I know you're going to talk about him, but it's trending up for him. And I think what they've shown over the past few weeks is kind of an anomaly. I think this offense is going to bounce back. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. You're a Chargers fan, so you're probably being a little more optimistic than uh, most people. But 
I am a little bit optimistic as well, probably because I'm a Melvin Gordon owner. But if you look at the chart, which I tweeted out the other day, um, switching from week five to week six, we saw Melvin Gordon, you know, they talked about it throughout the week and how they wanted to get Melvin Gordon's reps up and his snaps up and whatever. And he outsnapped him, he outcarried him, he ran more routes, he had more total touches, had better day from a fantasy perspective. Still not anywhere near where you want to be in terms of uh, Melvin Gordon owner from what he gave you last year and what he's given you last couple of years, right? He is not at that workhorse level yet. But I think it's trending in the right direction. And I've said this a couple of times already, but like the concern is no longer Eckler, right? Melvin Gordon is going to be the guy, even if he's at 65 to 70% of the snaps and Eckler's still getting 30, 35, that's what it's always been, right? We just need the touchdowns. We need the receptions, which he's seeing. He's seeing a ton of targets. He's seeing a lot of touches, which I think will eventually translate into it. The problem is the actual team overall, the offensive line, which ranks 25th in run blocking per PFF. They lost Pouncey, obviously, recently. Um, but what I think is like we're looking at these last couple games the first game back I didn't expect much from Melvin Gordon he looked fine if you're watching him play um, he didn't I mean I, I never really thought he was you know a generational type talent but he's in a good opportunity spot I think he looks just like the old Melvin Gordon I'm not worried about that Pitt ranks number one per PFF in run defense so I didn't expect really anything from him this game they beat themselves they let up like five drives that they could have had a ton more opportunities, right? They had a tipped interception, a backwards pass over Melvin Gordon's head that ended up in a turnover. Um, so this game obviously could have been bigger. He could have had a lot more opportunities, more touches, but I wasn't expecting a lot. Now they do play at Tennessee. They do play at Chicago over the next two weeks. So it might not be a time necessarily to buy low on MG right now, because I think that he'll probably have a couple more bad games over the next couple of weeks. Although I think he could take advantage of Tennessee. But after that, he seems like a good buy low candidate for me gearing up towards the fantasy playoffs. I mean, week nine, Green Bay, 31st per PFF against the run. Oakland, week 10, 27th per PFF. KC, 32nd, last in the league. They get their buy in week 12, and then they get a tough matchup against Denver. They get Jacksonville, who's 23rd, Minnesota in week 15, and then your fantasy championship, Oakland again. So they should control the game script, and those are defenses. The four out of six games after these next two tough games – end up with really, really easy run defenses. So hopefully by that time, you know, he's taking control of the backfield. It's going to be a tough two weeks probably for Melvin Gordon owners right now. But I just want to get that in your mind that if he does struggle, I wouldn't put all the blame on him right now. I think there are a lot of things working against him. And by the time the playoffs come around, he will be the Melvin Gordon, or at least, you know, 85% of what we've expected from Melvin Gordon over the last couple of years. Yeah, these past two games, they went down 14 nothing in a matter of probably five minutes in each. So it hasn't been a good game script for him, and it's been against two really good run defenses. Run defenses, So I wouldn't put too much stock into him not having great performances because, as you said, we've seen him get the carries. We've seen him even be used in the passing game. Phil Rivers, like, threw a little lateral that they fumbled for six. So that was fun. Um, but, yeah, this, this offense has looked terrible, but we've seen Melvin Gordon produce behind a terrible offensive line two years back. Um, last year they were a little bit better when they brought in Pouncey, but um, he's going to get the volume. And they historically just, like, other than tight end, they love to throw to the running back in the red zone. And we didn't see that this week. They only used Hunter Henry, basically. So I think last year they were 28% of their passes inside the 20 went to running back. So as that starts to come to fruition, he's going to be, you know, having a little bit higher of a ceiling touchdown-wise. And, yeah, as the touches are there, he's going to build on that floor. And I like him a little bit more than Freeman just because we at least know this offense wants to commit to the run a little bit. Yeah, and, you know, I, I heard this on a podcast the other day that I was listening to. I forget what fantasy podcast. And, I, and I, I do have to agree with it. Like, when we do these videos, buy low and sell high and stuff, like, most of these guys shouldn't be obvious. Like, you should have a little bit – if they are truly buy low guys or truly sell high guys, you should have a little hesitation giving them away or buying these guys, right? If, if that's not the case, then they're not really buy low or sell high guys. And you're not – I don't really think you're doing fantasy football correctly in terms of, like, trading because – I mean, when you do trades, obviously we see some ridiculous shit come through our Twitter mentions and in the YouTube comments and stuff where you're getting just a ridiculous amount of value for almost nothing. But for the most part, when you're trading, I mean, it should be a swap where both teams end up getting value from it. But like a guy like Diggs, you love the talent so much that you're like, fuck, I don't really want to give him up because he could explode in a lot of matchups. But like you're still banking on you know, the research that you've done, coming to our videos and hearing other podcasts and stuff. Same thing like Melvin Gordon. So I guess I'm telling you he's a good buy low candidate, but if I'm being completely honest, like I don't feel that confident in Melvin Gordon being the RB1 that he's going to be going forward. I just think if you look at the raw data and the objective viewpoints of like what we've seen so far and what we're going to see going forward, those are the things you have to really look at. So yes, like some of these guys will be easy to buy. Some of them won't be easy to buy. And you'll feel a little hesitant pulling the trigger on probably any trade that you do in fantasy football. But I don't really know what the point of the spiel was, but that's, that's, that's normal. All right. So trading yeah. is uh 
Trading is an art, not a science. Yeah, you made sense. It's like what Omar said. It's all in the game, yo. You got to like, you <laughs> see, I did watch that show. But uh, you got to like, you have to take some risks sometimes. Like Melvin Gordon, sure, he hasn't been good, but we've seen him be good in the past. And if you can acquire him for a cheaper price, while there's still risk there, maybe he is just a guy who's going to put up 40, 50 yards a week and you kind of, you missed out on that opportunity. You're not investing so much on him right now that you're paying the price of what you hope he turns out to be. You're paying right. the price of what he is now. So high because yeah. it's not like it, there's obviously a risk in every guy that you acquire, but if it doesn't work out, you bought him low. Like you didn't risk that much and vice versa. You sell, you sell someone high. So if they do continue playing at that high level, at least you got something worthwhile in return. Yeah. And kind of opposite to that whole like spiel and you're going to, it's not going to flow well, but a guy who's a little bit more obvious of a buy low um, is DJ Chark of the Jacksonville Jaguars. I forgot we had one more guy. Yeah, so <laughs> maybe we'll just cut that and put that at the end. Uh, okay. Nah, too much editing. Um, Go. Yeah, so he, he's he's very similar to Terry McLaurin of last week, where it's a guy who coming into the year like nobody was talking about and nobody really knew about. Um, but we all we've seen out of these two guys, and specifically talking about Chark, is just dominating the team's looks. He has 39% of his team's air yards, which is the eighth highest in the NFL. And it's not like Stephon Diggs where he's dominating the looks and the team isn't throwing a lot. Like he has 625 air yards, which is the eighth most in the NFL as well. So DJ Chark is getting the looks on his own team. And in respect to the entire league, he's also getting a ton of air yards. So it's not like he's dominating a small pond in a sense, but a big fish in a small pond. But um, on top of that, he's also number one in the red zone usage and red zone targets on his team among active players. James O'Shaughnessy had one more than him, but uh, he's out for the year with a torn ACL. So he's being used in that facet of the game. And on top of that, the, like the part of his game that we most he's most known for is, you know, he's 6'2", 6'3", runs a 4'3". It's the deep receiving game. And it's not just like a Dante Moncrief type of thing where it's like, oh, he's big and fast and he can do it. We've actually seen Chark do it this year. He has the third most deep targets with 13, um, the most deep receptions with eight, the most deep yards with 290, and the second most deep touchdowns with three. So he's getting you those chunk plays, those bonus yardages. And we've seen him go over 100 yards a handful of times he has a ton of touchdowns. His pace right now is ridiculous. It's like eight, uh, 80 catches, 1,400, eight yards, and 13 t- touchdowns. So him coming off of two bad games in his last three where he put up like three or four catches for 40-something yards in each of those, um, buying low on a guy who I really think is not a wide receiver too this year just based off of usage, um, him being easily uh, the clear-cut number one in this offense, and the rapport he's had with not even Minshew like alone, but also Foles. Like in that first game that they played, I know Foles only threw – eight passes two of them went his way which is a 25 percent market share so you take that for what it is like he didn't throw a lot but he obviously looked his way (laughs) always but um one of those one of those throws was like a 45 yard touchdown down the sideline so we've seen both quarterbacks look at him in the deep game so I don't think if like Minshew came off a pretty bad game I don't think that you should be worried about if there is a quarterback switch how that affects Chark because He's, he's the number one guy. He's proved it. And I think Nick Foles sitting on the sideline has seen that too. And on top of this whole thing, his schedule down the stretch is the exact opposite of Devonta Freeman's in the sense that it's absolutely elite. Other than like the Chargers in Tennessee, who by that time, the Chargers probably won't have anybody left in their secondary. Like other than that, they play Houston, Indianapolis, Tampa Bay, Oakland, Atlanta. And for weeks 15 and 16, like your fantasy championship and leading up to it, Oakland and Atlanta are probably the two best defenses you want to face, um, a receiver wants to face, and you're going to rely on production out of him. I think with this schedule, the usage he gets, and just the team that actually wants to throw the ball, which is a little bit different from years past in Jacksonville, um, he's easily going to finish as a wide wide receiver too this season. Yeah, I mean, with with Shark, like the way I look at it is this is something you don't even really need to dive into the numbers for. Like he checks every box, big, strong, fast the clear number one on his team his quarterback absolutely loves him he's producing he's getting every type of target you can get all the valuable targets the ones in the end zone the ones downfield the 40 yard shots he's acting as a possession receiver he's getting tons of targets right Tar- individual target games of nine eight eleven seven catch games of seven and eight like these big yardage games are coming the touchdown games are coming the long throws down the field are there the end zone throw. like he checks basically every box that pe- people want to fade Chark just because it's a small sample size and he's like playing too good and we've never seen him do it before. But if, if you just step back and look at it objectively, like he also just passes the eye test too. The guy just looks really fucking good and looks like a good football player. So you combine all those things together 
and you can continue to like, you know, knock random things about him. Like, Oh, you know what? As soon as he stops catching touchdowns, he's not going to be that good, but it's like the volume is there. So if he makes a, a big play, then that substitutes for the touchdown. If he makes the touchdown substitutes for the big play, vice versa. If they come together, like we've seen in, two of the six games that he's played so far, right? Four for 146 and a touchdown in week one, eight for 164, two touchdowns in week five. Like that is a culmination of who DJ Chark is, all clicking in one scenario. So I, I expect like two or three more of those games from Chark. Sure, he'll have a couple more like four for 45 games. But anytime you're talking about the wide receiver two range, it's going to be up and down. But give me the guy who is the clear wide receiver one on a team, Jacksonville, that we expected to run the ball a lot. But they are passing at a very, very, very high rate. They clearly trust Minshew and We'll see what happens at the quarterback position when Foles is finally ready to come back. But they want to sling it. They gave him a lot of money to do so. Um, so I'm not really worried about this being a scenario where Chark's volume falls off because he's just proven to be too good up to this point. Yeah, and in those games that he has been good, four of them, he's played pretty good defense. He's played at Carolina, at Denver, Tennessee, and New Orleans. And that pace that I brought, brought up earlier was in playing these games. Like It's not like he's been playing slouches of defenses, and he's produced against – uh, at least half of those defenses. I know against uh, Denver and New Orleans, those were his down games, but basically every other game he's finished as a wide receiver two or better. So yeah, down the stretch, like would you rather have him or Adam Thielen? Thielen. Thielen's just been I, too consistent. He's, he's, he's proven it too much. Even in this offense, he just keeps getting it done. I think it's very close. I think I might take Chark there. Oh man, if we were- that's, league, that's what makes me FB fraud, so. <laughs> hey, you just beat me in our fucking league, so respect. Not really, but did you move ahead <laughs> in the standings? What happened? Did you move ahead of me in the standings in that league? Uh, I haven't checked. I don't know. I think I fell quick. I went from like second or third place down to seventh or eighth. Everybody's like three and three. It's just like points yeah. at this point. That, that league is such a clusterfuck. My depth is starting to hit me now. Like one or two injuries and you immediately just like your team gets yeah. absolutely shit-faced. I have like one more games without Saquon Barkley than I did with him. So I don't know what that means for my team. I mean, positive regression. <laughs> For you, bro. All right. Well, that's all we got for y'all today. We stream this live when we can figure out the audio on Twitch. So if you want to join us live next week, it's twitch.tv slash big dogs fantasy. Go follow us, go subscribe, whatever they call it on Twitch there. And you'll be able to uh, live stream with us. We'll answer some Q and A's after the filming is done. Uh, so do that. We do that at four between four and four 30 PM Eastern time on Tuesday nights. You can go subscribe to us on Patreon, patreon.com slash BDGE, where you'll get exclusive content, the waiver wire article, weekly rankings, private uh, community or forum where we'll answer your questions as well as a private live stream. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button down below. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're new. If you're listening via podcast, make sure you give us a rating and review on iTunes and follow us on Twitter. And Jesus fucking Christ, it'll all be in the description down below. I can't plug any more. But I love you guys. So, so we'll see y'all on the next video. I love you. Bye. Bye.